Zero and lift off, the final lift off of Atlantis on the shoulders of the space shuttle. America will continue the dream. Hey everyone, Silver Steeler here. And winning image photography. So it was my time to have this two ounce salivate metal round for the Salivation Nation Tour, an idea created by Silver Heist to take this round around the world. And boy, has it gone around the world. And now it's at... The largest military aviation museum in the world. Located at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base near Dayton, Ohio. In the background is a B-29 Super Fortress. It's a four-engine, propeller-driven heavy bomber that was used in the late stages of World War II and the Korean War. This B-29 is famous for having dropped the second nuclear bomb on the city of Nagasaki, ending World War II. The name of this plane? Boxcar. This Air Force Museum has four massive climate-controlled hangars. This plane is located in Hangar 2, and it's the only plane we visited in Hangar 2. A little bit hard to get this focus with the shiny metallic background of the plane. Boxcar was in service from April 1945 to September 1946. It was delivered to this museum in September of 1946, and has been here ever since. A beautiful round with a beautiful plane behind it. This is Little Boy, the first nuclear weapon that hit Hiroshima. And this is Fat Man, the second nuclear weapon used on Nagasaki. Just a gigantic fuselage. This was considered state of the art at the time. It had a pressurized cabin and an analog computer to fire off four remote machine guns with inside the craft. And oh my gosh, there's somebody still in there. Is he taking pictures? I think so. The design, production, and concept of this plane cost $3 billion. That's equivalent to $43 billion in today's money. It far exceeded the Manhattan Project in total cost and was the most expensive project of the war. There were two types of engines used on this plane. The first engine had reliability issues. By the time the Korean War happened, this was resolved with the second engine. This jet is known to many as the Blackbird. It is the SR-71, a long-range, high-altitude, strategic reconnaissance aircraft that was developed by Lockheed. This was one of the first aircraft to be designed with a reduced radar cross-section. It had no offensive capabilities. If a missile were launched towards it, it would simply accelerate and outfly the missile. The SR-71 served the Air Force from 1964 to 1998. A total of 32 aircraft were built. 12 of them were lost in accidents with none lost to enemy action. It currently still holds the record set in 1976 as the world's fastest air-breathing manned aircraft. This jet always seems to be one of everyone's favorite jets and I can understand why. Beautiful aircraft. So as we were walking around in Hangar 3, this plane sort of just stood out because it didn't really have a lot in front of it. So I thought, hey, time to pull out the salivate metal round and shoot another plane behind it. This is the C-133 Cargo Master. It was used extensively in the Vietnam War and there were 50 of them produced. When the Lockheed C-5 Galaxy entered service in 1970, the C-133 was retired. This is the F-4 Phantom II. It is a supersonic jet capable of going at speeds of Mach 2.2, and it is also a fighter and a bomber. This jet was mass produced. It started in 1958, it came into service in 1960, and it was eventually replaced by the F-15 and the F-16. Its last theater of war was as late as the Persian Gulf War where it served in reconnaissance in 1991. 62 years after its first flight, the F-4 remains in service for many countries, including Japan, South Korea, Greece, Turkey, and Iran. Although Iran has not received spare parts for many decades. So here's the sow round in front of a very famous aircraft. And I love the painted teeth on it. Makes it look really mean. 
This is the F-117 Nighthawk, also commonly referred to as the Stealth Fighter. It was strictly a ground attack aircraft. They were shrouded in secrecy to the public until being revealed in 1988. Of the 64 made, 59 were in service and 5 were prototypes. The F-117 was widely publicized for its role in the Persian Gulf War of 1991. It was also used in a conflict in Yugoslavia, where one was shot down by a surface-to-air missile in 1999. It was the only Nighthawk to be lost in combat. The F-117 retired in 2008 due to the F-22 Raptor coming online. Despite the retirement, a portion of the fleet is kept in airworthy condition. They've been observed flying as recently as July of 2019. In 2016, Winning Image Photography and I went on a cross-country trip, and I believe we saw a couple of these up in the skies in Montana, remember? Yeah, um, I didn't get any pictures, though. We were driving. This is the A-10 Thunderbolt, or better known by its popular nickname, the Warthog. Basically, it was a plane wrapped around a gun. It was used for close air support for ground troops. The airframe was also designed for durability, with as much as 1,200 pounds of titanium armor around its cockpit and aircraft systems, enabling it to absorb a significant amount of damage and continue flying. The U.S. Air Force had plans to phase out this aircraft with the F-35, but that hasn't happened yet and it remains in service today. This is the AC-130 Spectre gunship. Enemies could hear this plane coming from miles away and fear would tremble within them because of the massive firepower that this aircraft had. It was an easy target to take out, however, so it primarily flew its missions at night. This particular aircraft is the Ezreal. In the Quran, Ezreal is the angel of death who severs the soul from the body. Iraqi revolutionary guards trying to escape Kuwait met this aircraft, much to their demise. This is the F-15 Eagle. It's an all-weather tactical fighter aircraft. It was designed in 1967, it first flew in 1972, and it entered service in 1976. It is among the most successful modern-day fighters, with over 100 victories and no losses in aerial combat, with the majority of the kills by the Israeli Air Force. The F-15 is still being produced and sold today to countries like Israel, Japan, and Saudi Arabia. Its production will end in the year 2022. The F-15's maneuverability is derived from its low wing loading and has a high thrust to weight ratio, enabling the aircraft to turn tightly without losing airspeed. And here we are at one of my favorites, the B-1 Bomber. It is a supersonic variable sweep wing heavy bomber. Its nickname is the Bone. It is currently one of three strategic bombers that the U.S. Air Force still currently uses. The other two are the B-2 and the B-52 bombers. The B-1 was first envisioned in the 1960s. By the 1970s, development and production had begun. It would be capable of doing speeds of Mach 2.2 and prototypes had been built, but cost overruns and the introduction of cruise missiles led to its cancellation in 1977. The program was restarted in 1981 due to delays in the B-2 stealth bomber. Since the program had been canceled and restarted with a four-year delay, a new design known as the B-1B took place. The Air Force started taking delivery of B-1Bs in 1986, and by 1988, all 100 craft had been delivered. It's a very impressive looking plane. Standing next to this, you'd feel very, very small. It's just mean looking, sleek looking. I like it a lot. The museum dates back to 1923 and now has four massive hangars at 224,000 square feet each. Hangar 1 was opened in 1971, Hangar 2 in 1988, Hangar 3, the one we're standing in now in 2003, and Hangar 4 in 2016. In between hangars 3 and 4 is this large circular, tall, building in which they house the missiles and rockets. On display is a Minuteman 1A, Minuteman 3, 
There's a Chrysler Jupiter, a Douglas 17A Thor, a Peacemaker, and a Titan A and a Titan C. Here we are in Hangar 4, and open in 2016, making the total square footage of the entire complex at 1,120,000 square feet. It cost $40.8 million. It houses more than 70 aircraft, missile, and space vehicles, and four new galleries. This is the Apollo 15 Command Module, Endeavor. It was the ninth manned mission in the Apollo program, and it was the fourth to land on the moon. The three astronauts were David Scott, Al Warden, and James Irwin. It was the first in the Apollo program to use a lunar rover. Scott and Irwin landed on the moon on July 30th, 1971. It was on this mission the famous Genesis rock was discovered. This is the North American Aviation XB-70 Valkyrie. It was planned on being the B-70 and was meant to replace the B-52. Its purpose was to be a nuclear-armed, deep-penetrating strategic bomber for the United States Air Force. The six-engine Valkyrie was capable of cruising for thousands of miles at Mach 3 Plus while flying at 70,000 feet. The introduction of Soviet surface-to-air missiles in the late 1950s put the program in jeopardy because now the Valkyrie had little advantage over the B-52s. Two prototype aircrafts have been designed and built. The aircrafts were used for supersonic test flights between 1964 and 1969. One prototype crashed after colliding with a smaller aircraft while flying in close formation. This is the only Valkyrie remaining. The top speed reached by this aircraft was Mach 3.08 on April 1966. So a little bit more about this 2 ounce Intaglio minted salivate metal round. I've got one myself, love it, shot it down by a waterfall and then Silver Heist decided to come out with the Salivation Nation Tour and let this round go around the world. It's been in Ireland, it's been in Hawaii. Wow, you can see why the X3 was called the Stiletto. Look at that sleek, sleek nose. It was canceled due to being severely underpowered. This is the Lockheed YF-12 prototype interceptor aircraft. It was the twin-seat version of the secret single-seat A-12 reconnaissance aircraft, which led to the SR-71 Blackbird. It set and held speed and altitude world records for over 2,000 miles per hour and over 80,000 feet, later surpassed by the SR-71. It is the world's largest, heaviest, and fastest manned interceptor to date. The A-12? 
<laughs> it's still a secret. Now it's time to go through a very special aircraft. This is Air Force One. It was first used for Kennedy's administration, and it took Kennedy to Dallas on that fateful day. I'm just going to remain silent during this little tour of history. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. In a warehouse, a sniper with a rifle poised waits. The cheers of the crowd almost muffle the three shots. The assassin's aim is deadly. The area is a swarm with police, rangers, and secret service men. The murderer slips the net, but a few blocks away, a man is captured after he is reported to have killed a policeman. That man is a 24-year-old pro-Castro Texan who once sought Soviet citizenship. He is charged with murder. Meanwhile, the president had been rushed to a nearby hospital where life lingered as a waiting world prayed. A half hour later, he was dead. of Air Force One, a necessary ceremony.
get a somber feeling walking through that plane, knowing that this plane took JFK to Dallas, Texas on that fateful day, and the very next day took his body back to Washington, D.C., and saw the swearing-in of Lyndon B. Johnson. A lot of history there. Boy, do we have a surprise for you. There were a couple space shuttle simulators we were goofing around on downstairs. And they weren't just simulators, they were tests. They were actually tests to see who would fly the next space shuttle. And they picked us! Woohoo! This is incredible. The two of us in Salivate Metal have been chosen to fly the next space shuttle. I don't know what my boss is going to think of. I'm going to call him. He's going to be like, hey, I'm going to need the next couple of weeks off. Why? <laughs> I'm flying a space shuttle. Yeah, sure you are. <laughs> We're going to have to get somebody to feed the cats while we're gone. Oh, not only that, but we're going to have to... Oh, no, that's okay. The DVR is already set for Gold Rush. What about Oak Island? Ah, they never find anything anyway, so don't worry about that one. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. This is incredible. You think this will affect the price of silver? I mean, is there any silver on board? I mean, y you know I got to touch it every day. We got the sale round. Oh, thank God. We got to go. I got to make a call to my mom. Got to make a call to dad. There's a plane waiting to take us to floor. Duh. Go for main engine start. T minus 10, 9, 8. I'm not so sure seven, this was a wise decision. Feels so good. Three engines up and burning. Let's explore. Two, one, zero, and lift off. The final lift off of Atlantis. Is it too late? Shoulders to turn of around? the space shuttle. America will continue the dream. Program, Houston. Roger roll, Atlantis. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. The space shuttle spreads its wings one final time for the start of a sentimental journey into history. Hey, Sal, the phone's for you. Who is this? The guy from the hall. Are you speaking to my office? Yes, this is Jack. Hi, yeah, Jake. I'm yeah. a consultant. Basically, what I do is just have a conversation to see if I can help. Can we explore our conversation? Let's explore with conversation, yes. Yeah, I am. Very good. So basically, what I what I do is I try to see what Houston, you are go for the RPM. Go to proceed in five, six, seven, six. Sal, I've got to do this maneuver. Get off the phone. Give me that. Go to proceed inside 600 feet. Time to see if the tests are right. I'm going to pitch this back. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's a little too fast. Textbook R bar pitch maneuver. All right. Give me a zero G5. You are go for docking. Atlantis on the big loop copies. Go for docking. We're initiating final approach. Houston copies. Station copies. Contact docking confirmed. Capture confirmed. Atlantis arriving. Welcome to the International Space Station for the last time. Let's explore! Lest it go unsaid, we thought that was just a beautiful and perfectly executed rendezvous and docking. Like as if there was any doubt. <laughs> Houston copy. Undocking confirmed. Atlantis weighs anchor from the International Space Station for the last time. 
Rendezvous officer reports a good opening rate for Atlantis. Atlantis, station is in attitude control. Atlantis copies, thanks. Atlantis now 30 feet away from the docking interface with the International Space Station. Everything looking good. Let's explore! This is cell round. Coming in. Line up with the diamond. Line up with the diamond. We're returning you back from space. 8,000. Discovery Houston, we show you drifting around the nominal glide path. Continue to follow the guidance diamond. 6,000. Discovery Houston, show you on center line, slightly high. Suggest you ease the stick forward. 5,000. Radar altitude, checking them. They both look good. Abby's got a lot of white showing. Discovery Houston, show you a little high. Need to get the nose down. Nobody gets lost out there longer than you. Okay, come right off the gear if you would, please. Roger, I got him. Free flare, 1,000. 500, 400, 300, 295. Gear's coming. 200, 285. 100, 265. Okay, everybody, brace yourself. Gear down and locked. 40. 30, 245, 10, 235, touchdown, 40, 40, 40. We made it home. Woohoo! Shoot down, deep rotate. Discovery, welcome home. Congratulations. Your landing was a tad flawed. Most of your touchdown parameters were within acceptable limits, but your airspeed was way too high. Ah, that's the way I like it. Though your rollout was short because you blew out the tires and came screeching to a halt. Keep trying, though, and next time, keep on the nominal glide path. Well, I hope you enjoyed learning the land the space shuttle. Did you hear that, Sal? He blew out the tires, so he came to a screeching halt. Oh, I did. At a distance of 16 miles from the... Congratulations on a great flight.